He said, in a broad sense, I conceive of all representational painting, every line and tone and hue of it as portraiture. This is Benito Juarez. Uh, he made an excep exception in doing a portrait of, of Benito Juarez in 1948, which the Pan American Roundtable in El Paso gave to Blair House in Washington, D.C. It's now lost. I've, I've, when I served President Bush, I was at Blair House many times and it's nowhere on the walls and I asked the people involved with Blair House and no one knew anything about it. So it's one of two pieces from Washington, D.C., one being a mural for the Ben Franklin Post Office, which has been lost, and one this portrait of Benito Juarez. Uh, Sam Rayburn was the other one that he did because he, he, people would, would sit for him. Uh, he, he wanted to do them from life. But C.R. Smith, who was a good friend of Tom Lee's, he was a first American Airlines pilot. Uh, he and other people uh, wanted to do a portrait. This, this portrait of Sam Rayburn, it's not that glossy, it's, it's from scanning it off of a book, but hangs in the Ray Rayburn building in Washington, D.C. And in fact, the exhibit that we're hosting now in the Mills building, the Wilcox family sent those nine paintings. Their father was a good friend of Sam Rayburn and helped Tom Lee understand kind of the character of the man. But he said they always heard about Mr. Speaker or Sam Rayburn, but until they saw their father, they owned the drawing, the working drawing, until they had this portrait of Mr. Speaker, they didn't really know what a force he was. <laughs> But Tom Lee, when he was in high school, had a, had an art club on the roof of that building called the Chot Mool Society, named for the rain god, the Aztec rain god. And he did portraits of friends after school, including Ethel Irene Howe, who was uh, Jimmy Rogers' mother. Uh, and I think she was sort of, they were sort of romantic in high school. But this was done on the roof of the building where I started my gallery. And actually, this picture helped him get into the Art Institute of Chicago because Gertrude Evans' uh, sister was named Norma von Swearingen and she's the one who connected Tom Lee to the Art Institute of Chicago. You see him over on the, on the right with his dad uh, getting ready to go get on the get on the train to go to Chicago. Uh, this is the one he mentioned of his brother, Joe, and it, how, how it, it warmed his heart to come in and see this. Uh, it was done in, I think it says 1928, but he was off at the Art Institute of Chicago and came back uh, and did Joe when he was 17 years old. A beautiful uh, uh, oil study. One thing Tom Lee said to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, you know, I don't think it takes much to mess up a human head. <laughs> he said the way Picasso did. Picasso was a genius in many ways and didn't always mess up the human head, but he specialized it towards the end of his life. He said, I think it takes kind of a superior, superficial, look what I can do. But he said to look at the human head and to try to determine how that head fits into the world how that person holds his head on his shoulders, what's going on behind his eyes. That's what a portrait painter does. Yeah. Have you all seen this one in the, in the, in the museum? Isn't it just a beautiful portrait? His, his uh, good friend was a painter named Fremont Ellis from Santa Fe. And Tom Lee was never really a joiner. He didn't join the Cinco Pintores or the groups of artists, but he always liked Fremont Ellis and had a lot of respect for him. And in fact, Fremont gave him the land on which he built his first little house with his first wife, who died in 1936. But Bambi Ellis is still living today in Santa Fe and representing her father's work. And she made a gift of this beautiful frontal portrait with the colors in her dress and of the yellow in the chair and the curve of the arm with that uh, hat and holding those flowers in her hands. It's just a beautiful uh, classic frontal uh, portrait. Uh, you also see her name uh, as if it's carved uh, uh, behind her. A, a beautiful portrait of a, of a, of a, of a girl, the composition. Uh, but it's a very modern portrait too, you know, with a very stark 
uh, background. So often people will say that Tom was, you know, as if he didn't know what was going on in modernism. And of course he did. He, he was very much in tune. Uh, he just always used the style his subject demanded. This is Tom and his wife, Sarah. His first wife, Nancy, died in 1936. And really, Sarah became, at the end of his life, he, called, he said his magnum opus was his portrait of her. Um, he had been widowed. He was working here in El Paso on the mural in the federal courthouse in 1937 when he first met Sarah. She had been uh, divorced. She was from Monticello, Illinois. She had a little boy. And uh, she came out to visit a friend named Catherine in El Paso. And she met Tom, and Tom introduced. I mentioned this last week at the Cisneros Library. But he looked at her across the table, dinner table at the Poxons, and you can see why it's say, she's the one for me. And uh, I mentioned this last week, but I'll share it with everybody. He took her, you know how artists will say, you want to come upstairs and see my etchings? <laughs> well, Tom said, do you want to come to the courthouse and see my murals? But uh, she said she would, and he took her to the courthouse and took her up on scaffolding and showed her these giants uh, that he did in our courthouse. They're giants of our history, of the I indigenous, the Indian, the, the conquistador, the Mexican, and the Anglo. And um, she liked it, but she got kind of hot and passed out. And so he brought her down. It's very romantic, brought her down off the scaffolding and got a wet cloth. But on the, there's, a, there's a, powder, a, a powder horn with a strap where he wrote Tom and Sarah. He met her. And she, anyway, she became his uh, muse, really. Uh, Sarah Lee became uh, Tom's muse. And I want to show you the first portrait he did of I her. just want you to look at this. Of course, this is this is this girl from, uh, Tom said things were so green for her, from her hometown that you could hear things growing. <laughs> and she, her house, you know, was surrounded by cornfields. And she, it's amazing how this woman, a book needs to be written about her, but how this woman came out here and married an artist. And her mother said, Sarah, how can you live on an artist's salary? And you know what she said? Watch me. And he also loved the quote by Carl Sandburg that a mountain is something that's fastened down. It's something you can count on. And Sarah was his mountain. Uh, she really was his mountain throughout his life. And you can see in this portrait, she is a mountain. When you look at her dress, uh, when you look at that dark sash, uh, you look at the, at, the, at the waves in her sleeves just as you see the undulations and the landscape behind her. It's just a remarkable portrait. And this is the one that was his magnum opus. Um, he did this, uh, this portrait of Sarah after he returned from World War II. But this man from El Paso, Texas, when he got home, he wanted to paint what he loved. He knew all the more what Mount Franklin meant to him. He knew all the more what his wife meant to him. So uh, this is called Sarah in the Summertime. And you can see where she's backlit. Of course, it's not the desert. Now, it's very interesting. When he came back, it's this verdant green. It's like this rebirth, this refreshment um, uh, of, of Sarah. It took him over 123 days to paint just the flowers on her, her dress. And he said, it, her mother gave her this dress, and he used calipers actually to measure her exactly as she was. And during the war, I've always compared this to Dante and Beatrice, because you know, Dante, uh, who basically invented the, the, the Italian language based on writing about his love for Beatrice, uh, Tom Lee, and he always held this idealized image of her. Uh, and Tom Lee during World War II had this photo of Sarah that he always looked, he said it was kind of a distant kind of worship while he was away. And then when he came back, he measured her and actually took longer than he'd ever spent on any other portrait over two years to paint her. her I'll show image. you. I want you to see the different styles. Tom always said he uses style as subject demanded. You'll see two different, very different men. I mean, J. Frank Dovey's part is not straight. You can kind of, you can kind of sense him as a professor, 
my my uh, my cousin was a professor at Harvard, and they called him Love, large unmade bed. Was it a large? So I think J. Frank W. You look at pictures of him, and he's kind of you know a little bit disheveled, and he was a folklorist, so he was a great storyteller. This this uh, uh, painting is at the University of Texas. It's it, 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 they're done with a brush and ink. Uh, these portraits. And then here's Carl Herzog, very different man. I mean, he was originally from, uh, he was Swiss, and it, Tom always described him as someone who just loved the smell of ink in a printer shop. And that's what he did. But aren't these extraordinary? These would have been, these portraits would not have been done for hire. They would have been done at, out of friendship. Uh, this is another, uh, artists a lot of times will do portraits of one another. Urbici Soler was a Catalan. Uh, Tom Lee had very high esteem for Urbici Soler, who did the Risen Christ on Mount Cristo Rey. And actually, he was, he was brought in by the Catholic Church. Tom always said he thought he, he finished that piece out of devotion. He never thought he fully uh, was fully paid. But here you see where Urbici Soler has done Tom's portrait. Uh, and Tom has painted Urbici Soler, the Spaniard, gesticulating with his hands, and of course, with the with the carafe, the Spanish carafe, and wine. You probably know it. This is this is a portrait that got Tom started with World War II. He was asked. He had done illustrations for J. Frank B Dobie's books, and the the uh, Dan Longwell from Life Magazine saw them. And he says, "There's this artist out in El Paso. Let's get him to do soldiers out at Fort Bliss, which were his first ones. This is an old sergeant uh, at Fort Sam Houston. But they sent Tom on the road to show American troops beginning to gear up uh, for World War II. And so the telegram at the bottom says, this is how it all began. But probably his World War II experience remained one of the most vivid uh, in his mind at the end of his life. This is a spread from Life Magazine, uh, and, and it was on, he was aboard the USS Hornet for two months, and then it was sunk. Uh, and so he documented the men and how he did this whole uh, layout with their portraits and what their roles were on the Hornet. Yeah, Henry, Henry Liu said that as long as Lee was in China, that he wanted him to do a portrait of Chiang Kai-shek. Lucy had been born in China and, and wanted this portrait done. So Tom, after doing H.H. Kung, the finance minister, uh, got a seating with Chiang Kai-shek, who was a very difficult subject because he was fidgety. He set a Big Ben alarm clock that tick-tock, tick-tock, and gave him, what, 50 minutes. And Tom asked for a little bit extra time, which was given to him, but very reluctantly. Uh, and when he finished, he, he, this would not be the finished piece. He would have done a, a drawing and then come back to a studio in El Paso to do this very detailed, um, incisive, psychological portrait of Chiang Kai-shek, who Henry Liu said that Lee was a good portrait painter, but that he failed to capture Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, he, he, I think, Luce was cited. I mean, he liked Chiang Kai-shek, who had uh, worked to throw the Manchu emperors off the throne. I think that's what Tom's father always said. But um, I think it just wasn't what he wanted to see. But Tom said he painted exactly what he saw. And um, he probably he was, was like a... Well, he, he, after, after painting uh, Chiang Kai-shek, he was shown into Madame Chiang's uh, quarters and she was not feeling well. She had on a lilac peignoir and she was reclining, if I recall correctly, Tom described it in my oral history, but it was like a gold colored chaise lounge. And um, when he went in to paint her, to draw her, Chiang Kai-shek in his robe, by then in a robe, walked across the room uh, very briskly just to kind of let Tom know, I know you're alone in this room with my wife. And Madam Chang said to Tom, my husband would be a very handsome man if he left his teeth in. 
<laughs> but she, he, he said he had to pinch himself because afterwards, after he finished uh, Madame Chang, she encouraged him to stay and, and gave him plum cake. He goes, here I was in the private quarters of Madame Chiang Kai-shek eating plum cake. Um, and she was a very popular figure uh, in the United States. They, be they belong to the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center. I think Tom, since Henry Luce rejected them, never printed them, Tom kept them. And so they came as a gift. I, I haven't gotten all that straight exactly when Tom gave some things to, Harry, to the Harry Ransom Center. Harry Ransom was a personal friend of his. Uh, there were some, were some pieces that were purchased from Tom Lee and some uh, that, were, that were given. But that's where these are housed now. And so some people, like Bill Chickering's widow, we er, earlier showed this man who was killed in the war by a kamikaze. His widow sent that portrait to Harry Ransom. Mary Yelderman sent George Burroughs, you know, where they know that they'll be taken care of. So that's nice, and a lot of are coming to us that way. The big painting of the left-handed buffalo hunter was Billy Ruth Simpson's, and she left it to the El Paso Museum of Art because she knew we were a repository. And I didn't tell you this story, Joe, but the other, uh, I, when it, uh, he was doing Mrs. Wu, the pretty, the beautiful Mrs. Wu, and then he was disrupted that H. H. Kuhn would meet with them. So he got in a black limousine, and they took him up to this, you know, where the finance minister was. But he told me this story that he was in a st he was in a room. I mean, I imagine in my head it may have been about this size, but it was surrounded by curtains. You know, it was all, curtains are all around the room, and he sat. Uh, for this H. H. Kung, and he talked about the light on this Mongol face, you know, this this uh, Asian face. And but when he finished, how he got up, and his legs knocked the chair over, and so it crashed into the floor. And all these people come out from behind the curtains with uh, machine guns. Oh my God! <laughs> Tom goes, I sat back down. <laughs> So very interesting. But this, you know, this is so, Tom loved the Sung School of, of Chinese painting. And when I led a delegation to China, it's like I sounded like I knew what I was talking about because I knew Tom Lee and I knew all about the Sung School and how in the, the Sung School there was earth and there was sky and there was man. And man was always very small. You know, man's small, like in our part of the world. I think that's one reason Tom felt a connection. But it was man who gave meaning to the earth and the sky. Tom says, not a bad idea, not a bad, not a bad, not a bad notion. But this is just an extraordinary uh, painting of uh, China. I don't know exactly. Uh, what someone it is. described him as uh, like a warrior, like sticking his head out of a cockpit, looking to pick a fight. And it was Churchill who said when he saw this portrait, I'm glad he's on our side. <laughs> and then G Jimmy Doolittle, uh, you know, the raid over Tokyo, that's his portrait. All this is done in ink, in brush, and his control of it, and it's almost like knowing every hair on their head. Uh, and then uh, Burt Balkan was a Nordic fighter up to the left. All these are just a few samples of what Tom did during the war. This one, uh, a man named Bill Chickering, and I was reading this in uh, Tom's oral history. He told me this story how they were at Pearl Harbor and they had kind of sharp words with each other because they were bo both both uh, correspondents. And, and Bill Chickering had said, you need to go, Tom had been with the Navy, he says, you need to go with soldiers and where they're spilling guts on the ground or, you know, it's kind of bra bravado. And Tom said, well, actually, Bill, I'm looking forward to getting home. But it ended up that he, he said, you need to get away from the Navy. Well, he ended up going with the Navy and getting killed by a kamikaze pilot. And so Bill Chickering, after he was killed, Tom did this portrait and mailed it to his wife. And I said, he never did things for pay, things like this for pay, but he shipped it to his wife. And he later told me, he says, I think it was too much for her, the look in his eyes, that look, that foreboding death. And so she ended up sending it to the Harry Ransom Center at UT without talking to Tom, which he thought was wonderful of her. So this is now housed there. But I wanted to juxtapose again. I think I, no, I didn't do it.
But anyway, this is, this, I wanted to give you, th this is one of the spreads in Life magazine. And this is, when we were at the Marine Museum at Quantico, they have the portrait of Captain Frank Farrell, uh, who's in the d lower right there, th whom Tom followed. He, he was part of the first wave that hit Peleliu. I mean, it was a slaughter. If you all saw the Pacific on HBO, it was a slaughter. Tom was armed only with a K-Bar knife and his sketch pad. And then I want to show you, he sent you that he sent, this is uh, uh, Rufus Oakley, he had him sign it. Uh, Tom Lee did a book, he and Carl Herzog, and you saw Carl Herzog did a book that now fetches thousands of dollars. Uh, but it, it was done with, in Marie Dungarees about his experience on Peleliu. And there's a sketch with, with uh, Rufus Oakley. I wanted to show you, this is a portrait of Dan Longwell. I'm going to go through these quickly at the end. But Dan Longwell was the editor of Life magazine. This is a man that he would have taken all his uh, pictures up to New York uh, to see. And when he saw those Peleliu pictures, he says, publish every one of them and I don't want to see them ever again. This is Bill Burroughs, who was, uh, he was the minister of First Presbyterian Church here. And I never knew Bill Burroughs. Uh, his widow uh, named Mary Yelderman still lives here. But Tom, she's the one who told me how Tom showed up. He would have sat for him because he would have worked for life. He would have asked him to do his portrait. But she said how the doorbell rang like on Christmas Eve. And they opened the door. Tom just shoves and says, you don't have to be rich, don't one of my portraits, just interesting. And then he leaves, walks up. But he loved Bill Burroughs. And Tom told me that when he was dying of cancer, he went, he was standing by his bed, he goes, what will I do? I think he was really like his confidant, and what will I do? And he said, you'll be all right. This is now Mary sent that to UT. I'm sorry I don't have one of your dad, Jody, because he did one of uh, Jody Schwartz, who's here, uh, General Polk. I don't have a copy of that. This is, J this is Jody, this is their uncle right here, uh, Charles Level, who was a great friend of Tom Lee's. And uh, here again, it's like he knows every hair on his head. It looks just like Charles Level, a very noted uh, a businessman here locally, who introduced Tom Lee to the Wind River Mountains, and he actually wrote a novel set in the Wind River Mountains. This done in pen and ink. And then this one's never been seen before. I went out and picked it up and had it photographed just for you all. This is Charles's wife. It's a very different portrait than Sarah, isn't it? Uh, but she's very, very elegant. This is Shirley Level. They lived on the east side of the mountain. They're kind of the twinkles of, you know, the, the lights of El Paso at night. And a very elegant, she was a very elegant uh, uh, woman. But I wanted to tell you a funny story about her. Uh, I told you I was going to tell you about person personalities. They were very, very good friends. And they actually, they used to call Shirley Level and Sara Lee the Gold Dust Twins because they raised so much money for worthy causes in El Paso. They were very effective fundraisers. But Charles and Shirley were very good collectors of Tom's, but they owned one painting that Shirley didn't like. She didn't want a yucca in her house. So that's the painting. She didn't want a yucca, so I think it was in the garage. And I think it hurt Tom's feelings because he always considered his paintings a personal conversation between him and his friends. But Shirley didn't want a yucca in her house. And the fact of the matter is, this, por this painting ended up being purchased by uh, Robert Deckard, who is the chairman of the Bilo Corporation, Dallas Morning News in Dallas. His grandfather was a good friend of Tom Lee's. And when we named the Tom Lee Gallery at the Museum of Art, he called me and said, I'd like to give this. I said, that's great, give it. He did, he gave it. Well, then President Bush was elected, and when Laura came for, for, for uh, Tom Lee's funeral in 2001, she says, George wants a painting for the Oval Office. And they chose this one. And a year later, after the, the Bushes, they hosted everybody who contributed to the Oval Office, including people from the El Paso Museum of Art. My husband and I took Sarah Lee, uh, and it hung there. You'll see Bono with the president. There it is, right to the right of George Washington. Well, Pete Level, Jody's first cousin, 
Pete Level, her first cousin, found out about this. And he ran into the president at, uh, in Boulder. And he says, Mr. President, my mother owned that painting, but she didn't like it. He says, but you know, you had a party, you had all those people come to the Oval Office, she should have come. And he goes, well, why would I ever? She didn't like my painting. <laughs> Did you know that, Jody? <laughs> I love that. Pete told me that. <laughs> Anyway, I did Tom's oral history at, at the end of, in 1995, and one time I used to, they were elderly then, and he had that macular generation, but on one of my visits, my great-grandfather baptized Tom Lee when he was eight years old, if you can believe that. Uh, but anyway, I got in the habit of going to see, I could teach, see Tom at least once a week, and on one of my visits, he asked me if he might do my portrait, uh, and he was failing in eyesight. But I sat for him, like your dad would have, and some of these other people. And it was the last portrait uh, uh, that he did. And I'll never forget uh, uh, Snuffy Garrett, who was Tom's uh, dermatologist, and his his daughter is is here. Uh, Snuffy wrote me a letter after because Tom invited him in to see what he'd been working on and Snuffy wrote me and he said to see this genius, this blind genius struggling to get your image down. You know, he said how privileged I was, which I I, I realize that, but I've kept that I've I've kept I've kept that letter. Anyway this is one that's never been seen. I started with, you know, portraits that he'd done where people didn't s sit for him. And this has never been seen. It's never been reproduced. Have you seen it, Jody? It was done of Sitting Bull, laid in his life uh, for a museum that never ended up taking it. Uh, it's now in the governor's office, but it's really a wonderful uh, portrait of this Sioux warrior that he must have, I found this photograph and even the hands, there were lots of studies the way he, he, uh, he had his, his hair. But you see this portrait of, of, uh, of, of Sitting Bull. But at the end of his life, uh, by far, when someone said, what was your magnum opus? He said without hesitation, you know, it was Sarah in the summertime. But he followed that up. He says, it's Sarah in the summertime, but it's because I know her. So thank you very much. Do you all have any questions? Any questions or anything? But uh, Yes, Jody.